So, so hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you're joining us from. My name is Ibrahim Omar and I'm a member of the CP Solvers team. I'm also a TP Recap team member. Uh, today we'll be having a TP Recap VMR. We will be listening to three of my very dear friends who will present, be presenting different cases that we've had during the last month. Aisha Oto, Hewiting uh, Rowan, as well as Mohammed al -Sana. During each of their presentations, they would go over one case and also present the TPs that were presented during the session itself. I would like to bring to everyone's attention in here that this session is supposed to be an interactive session. So if you have a question, if you have a thought, or if you'd like to share something, please use the chat box in order to do so. I'd like to remind everyone as well that in our, in our daily VMRs, we actually have a team that is dedicated to reviewing cases. So if you're a medical student, if you're a resident, if you're a fellow, or even if you're an attending, and you'd like to present a case on one of our daily VMRs, please feel free to reach out to their email and they'll make sure that they hook you up with a mentor who would go over your case so that you can present your case. So, uh, Hewiting, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, so, my name is Hui Ting. So, I'm going to do a TB recap from a case on August 18. And the case was presented by Dr. S uh, Sanjay and discussed by Dr. Rabi and Professor. Uh, so the problem representation is a 43 years old male presenting with a sudden onset of chest pain. And uh, in this patient, the uh, past medical history, uh, family history, social history, as well as physical exam in order to be within normal limit, but further evaluation revealed to have pancytopenia and the lab results suggested of a non-immune hemo uh, hemolysis and a low B12. So in this case, it is important to, uh, because we evidence uh, hemolysis, uh, I wanted to just mention the difference between the terminology of hemolytic anemia versus non-hemolytic anemia. So hemolytic anemia, it refers to the increased destruction of the RBCs, and the non-hemolytic anemia is a decrease in the production RBC. So in the case presentation, we evidence there's a hemolysis, and we can see that there's a cell lysis, um, and that we can see it from the increase of LDH, and also we see the evidence of the red blood cell, um, a specific markers such as uh, decreased hemoglobin, decreased haptoglobin, and increased bilirubin as well as uh, peripheral blood smear we're going to see uh, the presence of cystocyte and i'm going to explain a little bit more later uh, what is uh, this mean and also in our urine analysis we're going to see uh, red blood cell that we, that is the hemoglobinuria so uh in the case presentation there was uh, something a very um a teaching point from uh, progressa about uh, the lab findings. So every time we see in a patient uh, the presence of anemia and thrombocytopenia, the, um, we have to think about MAHA. And in this case, uh, which is micro, um, micro uh, angiopathy and uh, hemolytic anemia, uh, that's very important. And when we see hemolysis, uh, we need to think about is it something arising from the environment? If it's something from um, the membrane or the RBC, or it's a problem is inside the RBC. In this case, uh, we think about uh, regarding to our patient presentation is more related to something from the environment. And within MAHA, also we have different um, different causes. And here, Progressa also reminded us the uh, when we think about TTP, there's a pentad, uh, fever, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal and neurological uh, dysfunction. And even though we don't see the whole pentad uh, with the presence of an increased LDH, thrombocytopenia, and cystocyte, we really have to think about uh, TTP. So here there is a peripheral blood smear that evidence a cystocyte. So here we see it's a red blood cell that looks like fragmented and has a, like a helmet uh, a shape. So the approach uh, for MAHA, which is a microangiopathy hemolytic anemia, there's a three common causes. And here there's a visual representation uh, of what happened in MAHA, that is the formation of the microtrombi and when the red blood cell pass through the vessel, uh, it starts shearing and then we see the cystocyte. 
and also the the platelet when it passes within the uh, vessel we're going to see accumulation and that's why there is a severe decrease of uh, platelet during this presentation so the most common causes for maha we have dic that is disseminated intravascular coagulation ttp thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura and we have the hus which is a hemolytic uremic syndrome so all of them actually share some common features but some of them have their differences as well so for dic the uh, uh, what is common in the three uh, causes is the presence of cystocyte. And in DIC, there's an increase of uh, PT and PTT, and there's a decrease in fibrinogen. And here it's important to notice that um, if we think about DIC in a patient, usually have some trigger, such as infection, cancer, trauma, or obstetrical uh, pathologies, uh, which we did not uh, see in this patient. So for TTP and HUS, so both of them have cystos, and it is important to order the Adams uh, 13 activity, which is, I'm going to mention why this is important. For TTP, uh, the Adams 13 is usually less than 10%, and HUS is more than 10%. Um, and in TP, TTP, there's more neurological finding compared to the HUS that is more predominant of renal uh, dysfunction. And here, TTP, usually the platelet is less than 30,000, uh, uh, which is in our case, the patient presented with um, a platelet count of 12,000. And in HUS, usually it's more than uh, 30,000. Um, so back to the ADAM13, why it's important. Here uh, with this, um, the activity, uh, we can measure um, if there's a deficiency less than 10% is almost diagnostic of TTP. Uh, if it's more than 10%, can be HUS or can be other causes. So ADAM13 is a protease that the main function is to cleave the 1 billion RAM factor. So in the deficiency of this uh, protease, there is um, a formation of more multimer of uh, 1 billion RAM factor that accumulate in the uh, endothelial cell surface and that happen and everything else is what I explained uh, previously. So now back to uh, TTP. So here the presentation already mentioned in the past slide. Here is important when we have the Adam 13 um, activity to see what is the uh, the the etiology. If it's something congenital or autoimmune. So uh, in our in our case, the patient uh, has an Adam 13. Um, undetectable and has uh, the inhibitor negative, which is the same to say antibody. So the ADAM13 when, um, when it's negative, the activity and the antibody is negative, the cause is congenital. But uh, when we do the ADAM13 and we repeated the, the activity, if that increases and we have the antibody negative, that's acquired non-immune uh, cause of TTP and that what happened to our patient. Our patient okay? And okay, and for the TTP, we also mentioned about a plasmid, plasmid score. So the interpretation of this score is the likelihood of a severe ADAM13 activity deficiency. Um, and here I, I wanted to mention this uh, really cool uh, clinical tool, which is MD calculator. We, can, we have different type of score, not just for TTP, but uh, for other condition as well. So let's do an exercise with our patient uh, using this score. Uh, so the first criteria, which is platelet count is less than 30,000. Uh, in our case, uh, the patient had uh, less than 12,000, so we have one point. Um, also, the, this hemolysis, uh, the bilirubin actually was less than two in our patient, and the reticulocyte count or the haptoglobin was not mentioned during the case presentation, so we don't have a point for this one. Uh, there's no active malignancy in the past year, which is one point for the patient, no history of stem cell or solid organ transplant is another point. Uh, in the case of a patient, there's a MCV less than 90. Uh, so, uh, but our, ca our case is uh, 101. So there's no point in this criteria. 
The INR uh, less than 1.5, or occasion had 1.30, um, was normal is 0 0.8 uh, to 1.1, which is half one point. And the zero creatinine in our case is 1.34, which is another point. So if we sum this, it's 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, and 5 points. So the total score will be 5 and put this patient in an intermediate risk uh, to a severe ADAM-13 activity deficiency. And another thing for, with, um, with our case, the patient had also a B12 deficiency that is just um, a secondary pathology uh, from the patient and that is because of um, of the past medical history of a, a, a long-term uh, being vegetarian that the patient did not really mention into uh, Dr. Sanjay and his team. Uh, once received the result less than 150, which was severe, um, they went back to the patient and noted this finding. And this is a different uh, causes of B12 deficiency. Um, so in another question during the, the case presentation is, why this patient had TTP? So, uh, and then uh, Dr. Sanjay and his team uh, uh, performed the HIV test, which was thought to be positive, and the CD4 count was less than 50. So, um, and here's some of the literature about the, um, the, the relation between the TTP and HIV. So at, um, at the beginning, we thought that uh, the relation between these two is because uh, the HIV uh, infected the patient and causes uh, direct infection of the megakaryocyte or immune-mediated destruction. But nowadays, uh, we know that the, the relation is because there's a deficiency of the uh, ADAM-13 activity. So there's, if you wanted to know more about this, there's a literature you can um, read it thoroughly. Um, so the case summary for this patient is a 43 years old male with a sudden onset chest pain, uh, no relevant past medical history uh, or family history. There's a social history with alcohol use of two or three times per month, and the patient is a uh, vegetarian. Um, so physical exam were within normal limit, and the important of here is that with a physical exam that it looks normal, it doesn't mean that the, that the patient is well, it can be a, a, a more sinister condition that is hiding. Uh, so the lab finding, we have a pancytopenia, we have a platelet very, very low, which is 12,000. We have an indirect bilirubin, 1.4, showing in hemolysis. And also here, LDH was very high, uh, 1,200, and there's a Kuhn's negative, and the B12 was less than 150. So the uh, peripheral blood smear, uh, it showed numerous cystocytes. The ADAM-13 was undetectable with no inhibitor. With the repeat um, uh, test, it increased the activity. Again, the patient was HIV positive and the CD4 counted less than 50. So the management of this patient was uh, plasma exchange, rituxima, and um, antiretrovirus. And here is an important point is that with TTP, you have to treat the patient empirically. So if you think that the patient is suspected to have TTP, you don't wait for the result for the ADAM-13 to come back. You have to start treating it with a plasma exchange. So some of the key points, uh, so always, always we have to rule out the life-threatening uh, life cause of chest pain before we move on to another uh, differential diagnosis. We have uh, some clues for hemolysis, which is a, th a thorough physical exam and check for lab finding with evidence of site lysis and red blood cell specific markers, as I mentioned before. And for the diagnosis of TTP, it's very important to order the ADAMS-13 activity and always, always check the immune status of the patient. So here's some of my references and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for presenting this great presentation today, Hu Ting. I like the idea that you presented the plasmic score, which I had no idea that it existed. I also like the idea that the ICs do not present always with sites. It's only 50% of them. Thank you for being here. So next, we'll be hearing from Aisha. So Aisha, please go ahead. The stage is yours.
Can you see my screen? Yes, you're good to go. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Aisha, and I'll be doing the TP VMR sub for the subspecialty that happened on July 24th. And our case presenter was Dr. Fran Serpa, case discussant with Dr. Timothy Maher, and facilitator was Yasmin, and my name is Aisha. So our, the problem statement for our case was a 63-year-old male with a past medical history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy who had a implantable car cardi cardioverter defibrillator in the setting of Chagas disease who presented with multiple episodes of syncope and ICD shocks in the setting of a monomorphic VT. And the imaging for this patient was notable for severe left ventricular, ventricular dilation with left ventricular systolic dysfunction and apical aneurysms. Um, I'll dissect further into this. And the patient also had subendocardial base late gadolinium enhancement in the basal lateral and inferior plus mid lateral walls. And the final diagnosis was an electrical storm from a monomorphic VT in the setting of a Chagas cardiomyopathy. So what do all these definitions mean exactly? Um, an ICD, which is a implantable cardioverter defibrillator, is a battery-powered device, which is essentially placed under the left side under the collarbone. And its uh, role is to regulate the heart rate. It connect, it's connected to the heart through wires that deliver the electrical shock, and it corrects any abnormal heart rhythm, such as, such as ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardias, fibrillation, by delivering an electrical shock when it senses an abnormal rhythm. So the appropriate candidates for getting an ICD are patients that have a life-threatening arrhythmia without any correctable causes. So these correctable causes can be an acute MI, um, electrolyte imbalances, or drug toxicities that are causing these acute arrhythmias. And there are some ICD um, um, devices that have a pacemaker feature. What this means is that if an ICD device um, notices that there is bradycardia, it can also restore this rhythm. And the three types of shocks that are delivered by the ICD device are inappropriate, appropriate, and phantom shocks. So an inappropriate shock is delivered when there is when the device misinterpret, misinterprets the signals. So this can be from the atria because a lot of the ICD are meant to um, notice any ventricular ar arrhythmias or ventricular electrical activity. But sometimes when there's an atrial activity, the device can send an inappropriate shock. Appropriate shock is for a life-threatening arrhythmia that stems from the ventricles, so the right ventricle. And phantom is the false sensation of the delivery of a uh, electrical shock, usually in patients that have PTSD from receiving many shocks recently in the acute setting, and they have this false sensation of receiving a shock. So the two types of VT, there's monomorphic and polymorphic. VT in general presents in patients with chest pain, lightheadedness, syncope, palpitations, and sometimes short dyspnea as well. And the syncope, which was in our patient, usually comes without any warnings. And a monomorphic VT is due to a scar tissue that forms or a fibrosis, which forms a singular foci in the ventricle, which causes the formation of a reentry circuit. So what this reentry circuit does is that it causes the electrical movement to be the exact same in every, beat by beat, which can be seen in the ECG here. So in a monomorphic VT, the QRS complex is always uniform. So it's going to be wide, but it's going to be uniform throughout each beat to beat. And this is because of the reentry circuit. And an example for monomorphic VT is a ventricular tachycardia storm, which is what our patient had. This is defined by a life-threatening condition with three or more episodes of sustained VT, VFib, or appropriate shocks that are delivered in a time frame of 24 hours. Now, this is a very life-threatening condition because it, even though a patient might have an ICD, it can the arrhythmias might get faster 
and the ICD might not be able to control those uh, those arrhythmias and not be able to keep up. So that can easily progress to cardiogenic shock and maybe even eventually cardiac arrest. So for a lot of these patients, we can try conservative uh, management with uh, pharma pharmacological agents with antiarrhythmics. So amiodarone and lidocaine have proven to work really well for these patients. And also beta blockers, they have great adrenergic activity that can stop the storm, stop the abnormal electrical activity. And two other invasive procedures include regional block that is given to the, the sympathetic um, still a ganglion, the fibers, the sympathetic fibers that go to the heart, a regional block using um, um, anesthetics can also be given, which can stop the storm. Or catheter ablation, where a catheter is passed, advanced from the femoral vein to the right atrium and over through the fossa evalis and into the left atrium and advanced further into the left ventricle where it cauterizes the source of the issue. So it can cauterize the fibrosis, the scar tissue in the ventricle, eventually stopping the storm. <clears throat> and a polymorphic VT is essentially caused by multiple foci that are formed in the ventricle <clears throat> that cause varying shapes and duration of the QRS complex. So an example is Tersades de Pointis which um, as you can see, you see here, it essentially looks like a party streamer. So it goes up and down, up and down and down. And this is called an oscillatory changes. And these happen over the isoelectric line in the middle. And it gives a very different amplitude of QRS complexes. So it, different QRS complexes in polymorphic, uniform wide um, QRS, QRS complexes in monomorphic VT. And here it also causes a prolonged QT interval in each beat to beat. So in our patient, the he had Chagas disease, uh, which causes cardiomyopathy. So Chagas disease is known to be prevalent in South America and Central America, causing about eight to 10 million um, cases. And it's essentially uh, transmitted by the parasite called Trypanosoma cruzi, which sheds in feces of a reduvid bug. And re once this bug bites a patient, and when they scratch that surface, scratch the skin, it goes inside the patient and causes the symptoms. And it's called a kissing bug as well. So the clinical features that it causes uh, can be categorized into acute and chronic. There are a lot of patients that do not get symptoms and they are okay for the acute phase, but there are some patients that can develop acute phase symptoms, such as mild flu-like symptoms, so fever, headache, loss of appetite, or generalized lymphopathy and hepatospinomegaly. This acute phase can last from days to weeks. Chronic phase can usually last from years to decades, so this will take a long time to develop. And if it does develop in patients, it usually causes conduction disorders, right bundle branch block, arrhythmias, like we talked about, VFib and VTAC, myocarditis, and dilated cardiomyopathy, which can eventually become heart failure, and increased risk of thromboembolism as well because of um, a clot formation in the ventricles. And it also affects the GI tract by causing mega esophagus and mega colon. And this happens because of the weakening of the myenteric plexus. And this causes a progressive dilation in the esophagus and the colon. Chagas disease can be diagnosed through direct visualization in a thin and a thick peripheral blood smear using the GM sustain or PCR to detect TQZ. DNA can also be used. And for the conduction abnormalities and the um, arrhythmias, ECG monitoring is very crucial as well. And in the acute phase, patients can be treated with anti-trypanosomal anti therapy. And one of the agents is ben benzinazole, which can be given, but that's only useful in the acute phase. And the chronic phase for GI tract manifestations, patients can be given laxatives, patients can be given increased fluids to help with the, the, the mega esophagus and the mega colon. And the findings that were prevalent in our patient were 
the left ventricular dilation and the systolic dysfunction. Both of these happen because of the damage done to the cardiac muscle, which weakens it and decreases the efficiency of the heart pumping out blood. And it cause, and also the inflammation that leads to damage of the myocytes as well, which decreases the systolic function of the left ventricle. This can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, and the weakening of the muscle as well it can lead to left ventricular aneurysms. It weakens the wall and causes aneurysms to form. And again, the blood, uh, the heart is no longer able to pump efficiently. And the subendocardial based late gadolinium enhancement, which was seen in our patient, that usually happens when a cardiac MRI is done and a contrast is given. So the gadolinium contrast. And usually there is a certain washout period that takes up, that takes um, place in a few seconds to minutes. And in, and in spots in the ventricle where there is fibrosis or scar tissue, there's increased enhancement. So in our patient, there was late gadolinium enhancement in basal lateral, inferior, mid-lateral walls. And that is where the fibrosis and the scar tissue was. And these patients are also prone to thromboembolism, which can lead to stroke. And this is important when patients are being considered for considered for catheter ablation, because you do not want to be putting in a catheter and possibly dislodging that thrombus and allowing it to cause a stroke. So that's very important. And a catheter ablation procedure is a very it's a very long procedure, which can take um, longer than five hours. So it's very crucial to stabilize the patient, hemodynamically stabilize the patient with fluids, make sure their vitals are good, their heart rate, their blood pressure. And they also need to be, um, the agents that they're given for anesthetics are also prone to causing cardiac um, depression. So that is why it's very crucial to stabilize the patient prior to the procedure. And so teaching points for our case is monomorphic versus polymorphic BT. Monomorphic causes uniform QRS complexes, and it's usually due to a singular, a singular foci that can, cause, that can be caused by a scar tissue or fibrosis that cause a re-entry circuit causing a uniform QRS complex as seen in this ECG right here. And polymorphic causes is due to multiple foci in the ventricle that are the cause of the abnormal activity, such as Tursad's de Pointes here. And VT storm, which was found in our patient, it's very, very important to triage the patient because the patient can easily and very fast, uh, in a fast manner, proceed to cardiogenic shock and possibly to cardiac arrest. So it's very important to put patients on antiarrhythmics, stay hemodynamically, stabilize the patient, give them fluids, antiarrhythmics, and possibly catheter ablation. And Chagas disease, which can affect the heart and the esophagus and the colon. And in the heart, it can cause arrhythmias, it can cause heart failure, thromboembolism. And it's very crucial to treat the patient in the acute setting if they do present with symptoms with antitrypanosomal therapy, or if it's in the chronic situation, deal with the signs and symptoms at that in the chronic stage. And these are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha, for bringing on this case today. Um, I think you did much more than what, what was expected. Um, and I liked how you actually went into details regarding the ICDs. Usually we were not taught um, that in depth, but thank you for doing that. So we'll be moving on to our last presentation for today with Mohammed. Um, Mohammed, the floor is yours. Please feel free to share your presentation with us. Thank you, Amar. I'll be sharing my screen in a moment. Can you guys see the screen? Um, yes, you're good to yeah. go. All right. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Asana, and today I'll be doing a recap of the case uh, that was discussed on August twenty fifth, presented by Dr. Sam and discussed between Dr. Rabi and Prof. Reza. Um, so we had a 
62 years old male with exertion of dyspnea for three weeks and upon review of systems which were mainly unremarkable apart from weight loss over six months uh, with a past medical history of hypertension on lisinopril and uh, social and family history were unremarkable. Upon exam, the patient had a uh, bilateral, he had bilateral basal of fine crackles and he couldn't be weaned off from the oxygen um, support device. Nasal cannula about basically acquiring three to four liters. Upon further investigations of the case, um, the patient had a pro BNP of 400-ish, um, HIV positive, viral load more than 2 million, and CD4 count of 54, and the remainder of the labs and um, of the case were negative within normal limits. A chest x-ray was normal. And bilateral, basically a CT showed bilateral dependent interstitial opacities with uh, surrounding ground gas opacities and also bilateral enlarged axillary lymph nodes. So in summary, we had a case with um, a 62-year-old male with new HIV diagnosis, low CD4 count, and hypoxemia, dyspnea, weight loss, CT finding of ground gas opacities and parenchymal infiltrative disease, and bilateral axillary lymph node uh, lymphadenopathy. So basically during the case discussion we first tackled dyspnea and we said um, we always think of dyspnea as a pulmonary problem first of all because it's the lungs main function to provide adequate breathing and we categorize the etiologies according to the anatomy so airway problem parenchymal causes alveolar causes pleural or vasculature problem. In our case, the patient had bilateral fine crackles. So we uh, prioritize the alveolar and alveolar process, whether it's like water from a pulmonary edema, um, pus or inflammatory fluid, um, pneumonia, or blood, even blood in hemorrhage. And then we have to always keep in mind the, the rest of the causes of dyspnea, a cardiovascular problem, a chest wall problem, a neuromuscular or a hematology or other metabolic causes, or even psyche. Um, then we spoke about hypoxemia and that it's um, objective when we compare it to dyspnea, where it can be subjective sometimes. And once we confirm hypoxemia by confirming uh, the patient's uh, uh, oxygen level and pulse ox, we think of it as either one, um, one of two problems. It's either a problem in the delivery of oxygen from the air to the alveoli, or a problem of delivery of oxygen from the alveoli to the blood. So if it's a, in the first entity, when we think of whether it's like a problem from the air to alveoli in that system, it's either less inspired oxygen, such as in patients who are living in high altitude, or like it's a hypoventilation problem. And all the causes of hypoventilation, whether it's like reduced respiratory rate due to certain causes or increased dead space, such as in emphysematous lung or ILD, or either whether like a, even a chest wall pleural pathology or even neuromuscular pathology. On the other end, when we have a problem from the alveoli to the blood, we think of it as either like a VQ mismatch or a ventilation perfusion, perfusion mismatch, impaired diffusion, or even right to left shunting. And um, ventilation perfusion mismatch could be, again, to an airway pathology, such as asthma, COPD, a focal alveolar infiltration, or even a vascular pathology, such as in PE, pulmonary hypertension, um, impaired diffusion, such as in ILD, or even right to, uh, to left shunting, whether it's like, and when we say right to left shunting, we either mean it's an intracardiac shunting. So basically the blood in the right side is going to the left side and then pumping it to the rest of the uh, body. And then you measure, you pulse ox the patient's is hypoxemic. Or it's like an indirect way of uh, right to left shunting in which the flow of blood is going um, accurately from the um, right side to the lung. But again, the lung is not basically oxygenating the blood adequately so the blood returns back to the left side of the heart according to the normal circulation but poorly oxygenated or less oxygenated and and again we have different causes that lead to this phenomenon basically when we have diffuse alveolar infiltration leading to poorly uh, oxygenating oxygenation of the blood alveolar collapse such as anatelectasis or even um, AV, uh, pulmonary AVM or hepatic pulmonary syndrome this is another uh, basically um, schema from the CP solvers. Uh, 
it's a very nice schema with beautiful drawings, as you can see. So whenever we have hypoxemia, first of all, we check if the patient's um, pulse ox improves dramatically with uh, providing them with oxygen, because this is a clinical clue that the patient has a normal AA gradient, which is the difference between the alveolar and the arterial oxygen. And then, as we mentioned in the previous uh, mind map, it's due to mainly hypoventilation or decreased inspired uh, oxygen, such as in people in, who are living in a high altitude. Or, or basically, it's an elevated normal gradient. And then we listen to the lungs and see if the patient has a normal breath sounds, uh, because if it's like a maybe... Um, a vascular problem, or the patient has abnormal breath sounds in which it's it's, it's a, an alveolar problem or a pleural problem, uh, and we have to check the imaging for compatible findings. Uh, when the when the breath sounds are normal, it's true it's important to rule out PE as a vascular cause, or even the um basically the the vascular cause could be but could, the lung could be bypassed by in, in such um in causes of such as pulmonary AVM or cardiac uh, shunting, basically, such as um, the one we mentioned in the previous uh, mind map. So this is just a, um, and because our patient had interstitial um, infiltrative disease with some ground glass opacities, whenever we see the, an abnormal lung opacity is seen um, on an imaging, uh, it usually refers to one of four things. It's either like a nodule mass, consolidation, atelectasis or fibrosis, or interstitial opacity. When we have, um, imagine these two stars. When you have consolidation, it's like really obscured. These stars, you cannot really see the star, but it's kind, it's kind of looking through an aluminum foil. And when it, when we have interstitial opacity, it's like um, looking through a screen door or like a fenestrated uh, um, sheet. So basically, uh, this is what it refers to ground glass opacity. When you have this partial consolidation and fine interstitial opacity, this gives you ground glass opacity in, com in comparison to a purely consolidation or interstitial opacity. When you have both consolidation and interstitial op opacity, this basically means you have ground glass opacity. And why I'm mentioning this? Because it's important to think of the differential. Um, so when we have someone with a ground glass opacity, we have to think of the differential of consolidation and the differential of interstitial opacity. So when we have ground glass opacity, it's usually the causes are so wide. And even radiologists, sometimes they cannot tell you what the exact cause. And that's, that's why it's usually reported in the uh, radiology reports for clinical correlation or uh, to consider other data of the patient. Um, but usually it's one of four causes, either like infectious process, opportunistic versus non-opportunistic infections, chronic interstitial disease, or acute alveolar disease, or other, other rare causes. Um, could be also potential. So our patient had also a bilateral axillary lymphadenopathy. Whenever we have a patient with peripheral adenopathy, we have to first um, classify that. Is it like local or generalized? Generalized meaning more than one non-contiguous region. And usually it's um, the causes of peripheral lymphadenopathy in general, uh, either infection, cancer, METS or primary, lymphoproliferative disorder, immunological, such as a drug reaction or serum sickness, so, uh, IgG um, for related disease, or other causes such as uh, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, and other diseases. Um, this is just a nice uh, table in which you can categorize the lymph node uh, with the drainage and corresponding um, possible pathologies. Uh, or the site of pathology. So our patient had by uh, bilateral axillary lymphadenopathy. So we discussed in the case that could it be like a an arm, thoracic, or a breast pathology, since these are the draining sites for the axillary lymph nodes. However, the patient had bilateral axillary lymph node, which makes you uh, which could make you think of a systemic cause uh, as well. So whenever you have a generalized lymphadenopathy, meaning more than one region, a non-contiguous region, you have to uh, think of infections such as uh, HIV, such as brucella, syphilis, typhoid, mycobacteria, and even um, EBV or mononucleases like, uh, like basically etiologies such as uh, early HIV, CMV, HV6, and Hep B, and toxo, other causes such as lymphoma, 
drug reactions or really some other causes such as SLD or rheumatoid or other, uh, as mentioned in the um, last point. Whenever we have a patient with a peripheral lymphadenopathy, we have to also consider other data and the other basically uh, symptoms, the background of the patient. And if you're highly suspecting a malignant process, then we have to biopsy the patient after ruling out infection and image that. If you have a less, if you're less, if your pre basically a test probability or for base malignancy is low, then you could go ahead and investigate and treat the suspected diagnosis with labs and imaging and follow up that lymph node. If it resolves, usually around one month, then you, there you go. If, if the, the lymph node persists or gets uh, worse, then most likely um, you'll need a biopsy uh, for that lymph node. So to connect the dots, the, our patient had a new HIV diagnosis with low CD, CD4 count, which means um, at risk of opportunistic infections, hypoxemia with crackles, which means there could be like an alveolar process leading to ventilation perfusion mismatch, a dyspnea, which could be an alveolar problem, as we mentioned, and we're thinking of um, pneumonia or pus-like uh, infiltration of the alveoli because the patient presented with other um, findings that could basically um, point towards an infectious process. And weight loss, we considered malignancy and biopsy the lesion. However, it was not done in this case, uh, especially if the patient had uh, significant weight loss, uh, which is defined as more than 5% in 6 to 12 months. Um, CT imaging of parenchymal infantry disease and ground glass opacity, we said that it's this is non-specific, but one of the differential is an acute alveolar process, uh, an infectious process, as mentioned in the differential of ground glass opacities uh, um, early in the uh, presentation. And bilateral axial lymphadenopathy, we said that it could point towards systemic causes such as an infection, uh, one of the EBV uh, basically mononucleosis like uh, syndrome etiologies such as HIV. So to connect the dots, we what was done next is that a beta D glucan was positive and then and a direct fluorescence was negative for PJP, but then a smear positive from uh, bronchalveo uh, lavage basically was positive for PJP. And the final diagnosis was PJP in a newly diagnosed patient with HIV. So finally, the take-home teaching points. Um, we have to know that despnia is subjective, but hypoxemia is objective. And whenever we have despnia, we have to localize the despnia pathology according to the um, basically um, causes that we mentioned, whether it's like it's a system uh, a, a problem in the pulmonary system, cardiovascular or chest wall or other um, systems and we have to confirm always hypoxemia then localize its pathology whether it's like hypoventilation vq mismatch shunting or impaired diffusion and we also mentioned that ground class opacity remember that it's a non-specific radiological sign the time course and the clinical context uh, narrow narrow the differential so we have to consider if the patient is immunocompromised such as in our patient who is an hiv uh, patient or baby, baby, maybe the patient is post-transplant, taking high-dose steroids. So the clinical context is really important. And peripheral adenopathy, we said when I approached uh, someone with peripheral adenopathy, we have to basically classify it whether it's local or generalized and the main causes of peripheral adenopathy in general, infection, cancer, lymphoproliferative, immunological, or other causes. And whenever we have someone with HIV, uh, with HIV, we have to consider the associated diagnosis uh, with that um, as well. So such as opportunistic infections, especially with a low CD4 count. Thank you so much for your attention and I'll pass the mic to Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you specifically for going above and beyond when it came to your hypoxemia approach, as well as to your radiological approach to ground glass opacities. So I think with that, we will end our session for today. Uh, just before we end it, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience uh, that we have a case uh, team that was put by my dear friends, Omeima and Diaz. So if you have a, a case that you'd like to share with us, please make sure to hit them up with an email and then make sure to assist you so that you can present on one of our daily VMRs. Um, thank you all. And we hope to see you tomorrow.